this is the seven decades tour. We're in 2023 now. You're on a tour for the new album. How do you say yes. the name of the new album? <laughs> well, the new album is um, comes from the word rock with an umlaut, R-O-umlaut, K, meaning uh, it's an old Icelandic word meaning destiny. And flöte is the um, German spelling um, and roughly speaking, the German pronunciation of the the instrument I play, the flute. So we can we can just cut corners and call it rock flute, which is close enough. Is this the single, the Navigators? Well, single is a is a somewhat euphemistic term these days. It really is just a placing emphasis on a track in terms usually of advanced publicity and promotion uh, by a record company for a new album. And so singles are not small, shiny black things that revolve at 45 revolutions per minute any longer. <laughs> they are they are simply, um, they are trailers, if you like, for um, for an album and an opportunity to, to get a, a flavor of what's going on. And, you know, being video uh, trailers, then there is a pretty picture or two for people to to soak up in terms of some videographer's ambitions in uh, in being creative with the medium and trying to reflect the lyrics and the nature of the music. But it's really nothing to do with me. I, I can take neither credit nor blame for so-called <laughs> singles. They, they are the work of the record company, and that's what they're there to do. They, they are there to use their expertise in marketing and promotion to give you the best shot of getting your record in front of as many people as possible. Well, so I mean, that's a, a it's, fair it's way a to go about company. it. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I don't do marketing and promotion in the sense of, uh, you know, originating and I play my part in it. If I'm asked to do an interview or, or in promoting concerts, not just in the U S but in many, many countries we play in, I quite often get asked by promoters to do some, some advanced promo, which um, is just helping the promoters to sell tickets and, reach the uh, potential audience but in terms of instigating it no i don't i don't really have that motivation i'm um it's 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 dirty work you know it's dirty uh, yes work it because is it, it's it's selling something you're selling your soul and so i i i do my bit but i don't really want to be the guy thinking up what should we do to sell a ton more records or concert tickets that's um somebody else's level of expertise and and background uh, i don't really do that stuff can you speak a little bit about the creation of the new album and how this has been similar or different from past albums to w where we're creating now yeah well starting off with the the album before this the album the zealot gene which was released in january of 2022 um we have to remember that it wasn't written and recorded in 2022 or even 2021. It was one that began back in 2017 when I started work on um, on the writing, the rehearsing and the recording um, of that material. But um, by the end of 2017, I'd only finished four four songs. The, the rest were kind of waiting there to be worked on, you know, given the... the um, the opportunity in in the gaps between tours and concerts and the same thing in 2018 I, I was by then working on a new project the Jethro Tull string quartet quartet album and that that took up most of 2018 between the many tours and then of course at the end of 2019 we we hit uh, the or the pandemic hit us and so for the next year and a half my intention to finish off the zealot gene was scuppered yet again because we simply couldn't get together to do the last few tracks in the studio and in the end i finished it off in the in the um in the summer of 2021 and it was released as soon as possible which was january 2022 you have to remember that whenever you finish an album these days when you finish the last recording and you mix it and master it you still have an interminable wait due to the time it takes to manufacture vinyl 
And these days, record companies all want to have a simultaneous release of vinyl versions of product because it is a small but a distinct part of the potential profit margin uh, in a in a declining uh, physical product world. You know, people don't really buy CDs very much. They're dropping off 10% every year. Mm -hmm. And vinyl is a, a small but a, a meaningful part of the market. So you have to wait in the queue. And uh, having finished the the uh, the rock float album, it was um, it was another wait of uh, of best part of ten months, I suppose, before the record could be released, and and uh, and here it is. But it's an album that began on January the first in two thousand and twenty two, just before the release of the Elegy. and I started off with um, the notion that I would write an album on the topic of polytheistic beliefs the beliefs in multiple gods. And so I thought about Hinduism, I thought about the Greek mythology, Roman mythology, and finally settled on Norse mythology because it's a little bit closer to home for me. It's the part of the world that I or my ancestors are from. And, and so it felt a little bit more relevant, more so than writing about um, the uh, the beliefs of Hinduism, which, you know, is something that are not really a, a part of my life at least not 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 since um not since the days of the beatles infatuation with maharishi said and right, uh, right. and mm -hmm. krishna and so on but you know i'm i'm a cold cold northern guy and um so the 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 beliefs of the norse myths was something that um i thought was would be fun to do so i tried to do it with a light touch I don't want to get bogged down in it being too serious, and I certainly wouldn't want to give anybody the idea that I was a believer in Norse gods. I mean, they are invented by man to be fulfilling a certain purpose. They are they are larger than life human beings, essentially, and um, but they're amusing because they have the same foibles, the same uh, values, assets attributes that that human beings have and their conduct and behavior is very human in both in good and bad ways so they, they do mimic in a sense the um the nature of humanity and that's um suitable material to write about because i could write in each of the songs um three stanzas of uh of more historical and observational lyrics about the characters and personalities of the gods and then in the last two stanzas i could explore their real world real time uh parallels in terms of my experiences of different people and knowing about certain characters and personalities i just thought that was an interesting thing for me to do but it's not really interesting for anybody else and i i think ultimately You've got to be aware that most people will just think, "What on earth is he talking about?" You know, this doesn't doesn't have any relevance for us. It has no bearing on our lives, and I fully understand that. But you know, some somebody has to do this stuff. Otherwise, we'd all end up sounding like Ed Sheeran. And although he is an excellent songwriter and a very clever pop writer, um, catchy tunes, I I, I think uh, we don't we don't really need any more. Whereas we're a bit short on people who can really put words and ideas together and do it in an original way and that's and, um that's that, yeah. that's my that's my attempt to do that sort of a job but i'm not sure if i'm really very good at it i just do my best the enjoyment of the road is is that something that you're you're enjoying <laughs> Well, you know, there are, there, are, there are various aspects to doing concert tours. And um, tomorrow, for example, actually not tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, I have to I have to wake up at 2.30 in the morning in order to depart at 3.30 and drive a long way to an airport to catch a, an early morning flight to the southern part of Italy to do a couple of concerts there. So it, it can be quite stressful and, and in some ways not really necessarily very enjoyable doing all the travel that is attached to doing tours. And, and in a sense, that, that applies even more so in the USA because it's it's a, it's a long way away from where I live. And mm -hmm. so that's long haul travel straight away. And then internally, uh, because I don't like to travel on a 
a, a bus, you know, a sleeper bus. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't sleep in a, a bus or I can't sleep in a moving vehicle. So I, I usually stay in, or virtually always stay in a hotel after the show and then uh, mm-hmm. travel the next morning. So most of my day is uh, is traveling by by car from where I've just been to where I'm going next. And it it, it is, a, you know, if you've, if you've done that for 10 days, I mean, you are getting a little weary of all the travel. And, and I suppose you have the concert to look forward to, which is the relatively easy part of the, of the day, but you know, the rest of it is not really very enjoyable. And I, 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 of course I'm, I'm working in many other countries doing many other concerts in, mm-hmm. in, in, the, in each year. And so, in a way, traveling around is is part of the job. I can't, I can't, I can't get around. But in Europe, I do at least have the opportunity, maybe to to go on the train, for example, and and then right. I find much more enjoyable as a way to travel because we have a lot of train services in this country and in the UK and and all over Europe. So going by train, you get to look out the window, you get out to you get to see things perhaps in a more relaxed fashion than you do from the inside of a, a car on the, uh, you know, on I-95 or something where frankly, the, mm-hmm. the, 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 the trip and what you see uh, on the freeways of the USA is not usually very attractive. Uh, so I, I, I'm a, I'm a train guy whenever I can do it. It makes life a little easier, but you know, mm-hmm. it's what I do. I can't complain about it. It's just, um, it's just that it's not all, um, it's not all fun and games. It's not all roses. Some some of it you you really you uh, you really actively dislike doing. But it's it it's what you have to do to get the payoff, which is to get onto a stage and play your music to people for a couple of hours every night. Which is absolute, and and again, just speaks to the overall humanity of it. It the demystification of production and putting on a show and the rock stardom and all the things that go along with that it it really is people human beings getting up and playing these roles that at the end of the day you still have to deal with whatever it is that you're still dealing with you never know what people are going through and it 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 really it, it it's changed my life drastically to be on the production side of uh, all of that to go to a show and see, uh, you know, the lights and the sound and the TVs and the projectors and all of that stuff. But to really see how it works and see kind of behind the curtain, it, it's there's nothing quite like uh getting to spend this kind of time with somebody like yourself. Uh, I I, I really can't thank you enough for taking this time with us today. Well, hopefully, all of the efforts in uh, in our uh, production and the organisation of, of tours and everything it will uh, it will be justified if people come to the concert and go away at the end of the evening moderately happy. Uh, not really there, <laughs> not there to change anybody's life, but on the other hand, an amusing uh, an amusing couple of hours to share some time with mm-hmm. people, and you know, and and, in, and perhaps you know, you have the feeling that you're sharing some emotions, sharing some some feelings with people on a pretty basic level because you can't expect them to um, necessarily go for all the detail in the background to the song lyrics or the, the more esoteric aspects of what it is that I do because I'm, I'm not an easy guy to... to um, to appreciate in terms of sometimes it being a little complex and a little bit weighty, but I do really, and I think I'm pretty good. I think I am fairly successful. I would agree. At moderating the the complexity and the depth of some things by still giving it a presentation, which is, you know, works on a relatively easy, straightforward level where you can just tap your feet, you can just smile, you can just groove along with it without necessarily mm. having to to go into the layers of complexity that might underlie it that so i I, th- I think you've got to make it work on those two levels and for most people it is the it is the fun it is the, the spectacle it is the the enjoyment of being together with other people and enjoying a concert whereas for me personally you know there are these other levels in which i enjoy um what i do um 
at least most of the time. <laughs> you know, getting to talk to and forgive the term, super giant rock stars. <laughs> uh, it you know the the silhouette of you standing on one leg with 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 the flute. You know, we we all have that image of the the rock flute, the 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 guy who brought flute to the masses in a way that nobody else has ever done. The humanity of it has been very transparent. It, it's clearly all written by a, a, a person who's taken time to really think and orchestrate and arrange. And I, I, I've personally have found your music to be beautiful. It's, it's moving. It's very cool to listen to. And it doesn't sound like anything else. Like when I put on the, the new albums, it sounds like Jethro Tull. Question. What are you playing these days? What I mean, I know you're promoting both albums, basically. Oh, you is... mean but your concert? Well, we were trying yes. to trying to include a little example or two from each of the um the seven decades in which Jethro Tell has operated from the sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, the new millennium, the 2010, 2020. So we're covering um you know, covering a big period of time, but um just trying to pick a few examples and then bearing in mind those examples you've got to make sure the songs are in different keys they're in different time mm -hmm. signatures different tempos uh, on different topics perhaps lyrically speaking so you want to create variety mm -hmm. you know create some light and shade in the set list but uh that's i suppose not it's not necessarily difficult to do because there's such a vast amount of material to choose from but you know you want to find you want to find the right examples that uh, don't replicate the set list you played last time you were in town, which is where it gets tricky because in some places, you know I'm playing there, you know not maybe not every year but it seems like it, mm -hmm. um, you know if I go to Berlin or Munich or Rome or Milan or um, you know wherever it might be somewhere in Europe then. Um, then I have a more of a tricky job because I've got to go back and look at the set list we played last time we were in town and try and avoid um, not all of it, but much of it, you know, in order that people get a, a different set of uh, right of uh, hand-picked references and ideas and songs that perhaps are the um, the ones that characterize different albums and different periods of, of time. So uh, that's what I try to do. But you're in the position where if you don't do certain songs, they're not going to be very happy with you. Uh, you know? Well, we, you know, that's that. That's why, obviously, there are some things that we will always we will always put in there. We have to do smoke on the water, obviously. And uh... <laughs> wait a minute, that that's the wrong set. Oh, a different friend. bunch of guys. Yeah, but it's um, yes. I mean, I, I think uh, I think the two there's really there are really only two two pieces of music that are always in. A Jethro Tiles show and their Aqualung and Locomotive Breath, which in their different ways are quite important songs. One mm -hmm. obviously being uh, about uh, about the uh, the the difficulty of homelessness as a social issue, and the other being essentially a song about um, um, globalization, population expansion. It's uh, you know, they're, they're, they're topics. That, that haven't gone away. They haven't changed since 1971. You know, homelessness is a is a bigger problem today than it was then, just in right. terms of sheer numbers, right. globally speaking, and um, and in terms of uh, the implications of of um, population growth, the the the, the, the uh, and its effect on ever more demands on finite resources on our rather small planet it's the, the, these are issues that haven't disappeared they are bigger now than they were back then so i yeah. i feel that they're worthy songs that are worthy of inclusion even if they weren't necessarily popular which they are they're, they're, they're songs that the audience love to hear so we we always include those yeah. but pretty much everything else is a movable feast did you always want to do a sequel to thick as a brick no, no, absolutely not. But the last thing on my mind until I was not exactly persuaded, but but cajoled into uh, giving it some consideration, and uh, I turned it down as an idea on a number of occasions when it was put to me by people from record companies, for example, 
Mm-hmm. Um, but it was only when I, I thought, I have an idea, I have a, a way in which this would be, um, I could take take elements of the original uh, album and reintroduce them, but with a, you know, a different, uh, in some ways I try to include some elements musically, which weren't, weren't um, so different. You know, there was a, there was a lineage. You could look back and say, oh yeah, that, that kind of idea. Yes, he did that before, but I obviously wanted to write new music that didn't mm-hmm. sound like I was attempting to recreate a, an album in the way that it was, um, that it was, um, you know, done before. And that that's always the problem when you're doing a Bat Out of Hell 2 or something. You know, people want mm-hmm. it to sound like Bat Out of Hell 1. Um, they want more of the same. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't think I'm very immediately drawn to that proposition. I felt I had to do something different with Thick as a Brick 2. Um, so I And I think I succeeded because uh, Thick as a Brick 2 did not top the Billboard charts. <laughs> yeah. So I did do something different. How do you like the remixes that uh, Mr. Wilson have done? Uh, well, they're, they're great. Stephen albums. Wilson does it. I, I would hate to have to do that. I'm not a, again, it's going back and revisiting something in a way that I don't think I would particularly want to have to do. Um, you know, it's to having, having lived through all those hours of working on the mixing and mastering of, of albums in the past, I think a fresh pair of younger ears not mm-hmm. that much younger, but younger ears, <laughs> yes. um, is a good way to to try and find a little more refinement from the original master tapes without um, without me breathing all over it. So I, you know, I I have my input when when Stephen Wilson is working on these things and Warner Music, who own the copyright to the original albums, you know, they consulting with me all the time about album artwork and. Um, box sets and contents and um and the and some of the elements of of the the, the 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 musicality and the way things are developing mix wise so you know i get involved quite a lot but i would hate to be the guy doing all of it it's just uh been there done that and let somebody else have a go i absolutely love your music thank you for spending this time with us Great. Well, very nice to talk to you both, and uh, we'll see you in uh, see you in August when I will be seventy six years old. So. <laughs> there we go. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and there another, goes the another, alarm. It's time. Another <laughs> August, another year. Okay. Good to talk to Thank you. Take you, care. Bye bye. Appreciate now. it. Bye.